Hello, folks. Brian Manzella. And as you can see, uh, we were going to pop Michael in, but he's there right now. Brian Manzella from the studio in the sky in New Orleans, Louisiana, with a pop-up full Manzella show. Uh, today is the 11th of January, 2018, and I'm here with my guest host, Rick Danny from Bethesda, Maryland, and our great friend over and here from Long Island, Michael Jacobs. So, uh, had a fun uh, early week, Rick. Uh, as a lot of folks know, I went to um, went up to New York City, and of all things, I go to New York City, and Mike is doing a Jacobs 3D class in Chicago, but I go up to New York City and uh, did a, a feature story for a Golf Magazine and a bunch of one-pagers. Great photo shoot, can't wait to show the pictures. You're gonna like uh, the article, I think, folks. And, um, you know, it's been cold everywhere, And but the golf instruction biz, which, which is what this show is all about, Rick, is heating up, right? It's heating up because we're getting close to showtime. Yeah, that's about the size of it. Um, you know, things went smooth in Chicago with uh, Jacobs and Silva, but the heat is behind the scenes. Yes, and, and, and basically, uh, uh, you know, everybody knows, everybody who would watch this show has sort of heard me allude to, uh, to put it nicely, a, a mild conflict in the golf instruction business over basically since November the 3rd, 2014. So, Ed, you do the math. <laughs> Three years and a couple of months. Uh, affectionately termed the alpha war, but there's no war, right? It's, 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 you know, there are real wars out there and there are a lot more important things than, than uh, how somebody moves a golf club. But it is important uh, for the history uh, books looking back at, at, at um, like, like somebody says a lot in this deal, getting it right. And uh, we went the direction we went to get it right. One of the things I read, uh, Rick, in the last... Uh, couple days is uh, we've been on a three-year campaign. <laughs> it's the funniest thing literally I ever heard before in my life. Uh, the math that is in Jacobs 3D is 30 years old. Stephen Nesbitt for the USGA with uh, the, the National Golf Foundation grant uh, figured out Frank Thomas, executive, you know, director, technical director, whatever, they wanted to know what, what the golfer was doing to the golf club, and Steve figured it out and got a bunch of patents. And uh, long story short, a bunch of us went to see Steve one day. Michael went back right away. He's three hours away. Me and Mike went a bunch of times. Mike went a whole bunch more than that. I remember walking in one day and Dr. Steve saying, you guys are relentless. <laughs> so we are relentless. And then one day, uh, Dr. Steve said, you know, if you can get me some good XYZs at a club, I might be able to do something for you guys. And, of course, Michael, uh, being more or less Steve's protege uh, with the golf science, uh, they got together and created Jacobs 3D with this 30-year-old math, okay? It's, you know, once you get it right, you don't have to tweak it. So, uh, I wanted to start this before I, I turn it over to Mike and, and, and interview Mike and let Mike uh, go to town uh, like, he, like he does in the Jacob 3D classes where, where he literally talks about the software and explains it to golf pros. You know, it's a 12-hour class live, two, two six-hour days. Um, so, so, basically... Everybody out there in golf who would ever watch this needs a simple version of what we're saying and what they're saying. And I, I think I can do a simple version. Michael will, will correct me if I get it wrong, but Mountain Dew kickstart, empty can, drumstick. That's what I hit, hit on those things over there. Now this, I'm just gonna talk about the bottom of the swing, but the differences in our analysis and their analysis, the other side's analysis, is different the whole swing. Isn't that right, Rick? I mean, we've, we've seen both uh, live. Yeah. yeah. It's the whole swing. Okay, so 
Imagine baseball. We're going to use baseball real quick just to get some simple definitions. You've got this bat in your hand, and you're waiting for Justin Verlander to come with about 98 miles an hour. So you're, you're almost kind of like <laughs> you're almost stepping before he throws. But you start pulling on that bat, and you're trying to decide, is this a pitch worth trying to hit, or I'm just going to keep the bat on my shoulder more or less, even though I kind of started pulling on it initially. Sometimes it looks like a real bad pitch. You see the batter pull on the bat early. That's linear force, pulling on the bat, and you decide not to, not to hit it. Now, ball's coming out of his hands. It looks pretty good. I don't know what time the batter has to decide. I'm sure the better the batter, the later they can decide. But now the ball's coming, pulling for a little longer. Now, you got to decide whether or not you're going to rotate this club in, the, in, in some plane of motion, the plane you're going to be on. That's the alpha plane. Or not. So here comes the ball. Looks good. So you rotate the bat by torquing it. You, you, you pulled on it, now you start rotating it by torquing it, positive alpha torquing it. And sometimes you're early and you hit it over the left field bleachers into the parking lot. Sometimes you're late and some guy spills his beer catching the ball for his, for his little three-year-old son. And sometimes you hit a home run off of one of the best pitchers in the world. But uh, the best batters, somebody like me, I'd get strike out one, two, three. But the best batters, waiting to see whether this ball is a curveball, they decided at the last second they're not going to swing at it, but they almost started to. They have to apply a torque backwards. Check swing torque. That's negative alpha torque. You see it all the time. They decide late. They, they negatively torque the bat. Check swing as hard as they can. They look at the first base up. Um, first base up says safe. Okay. So we're going to use those terms real quick. In their analysis, they're saying, no matter how you pull on the bat early, how you pull on the club early, whether you lay it down or stand it up, make Justin Thomas's backswing or Matt Kuchar's backswing, no matter whether you're 225 rotation angle like Brian Manzella or 320 like Jamie Sadlowski, no matter whether you're a lagger like Sergio or a thrower like David Toms, no matter whether you push your hands forward at the end of the downswing, because some people thought that was a good idea. All three of us tried to do it at some point, our own, our own swings. Or you're a throw, throwaway artist. No matter what you do, you're not trying to do this, but you're going to apply check swing torque at the end because you just can't help yourself. And when you look at swings in the other side's software, printouts, whatever you want to call them, Everybody pretty much looks the same. We have swings, including one Mike's going to talk about in a little while, a few, but I think that's fair, that pulls so hard back on it that there is some negative alpha torque to line the club up for impact. But most of the time what we see, is, especially in modern golfers, is everybody's dragging the handle forward, and that causes the bat to want to rotate back, and you have to torque through that to hit the ball. And the more you shove your hands forward, the more blowback you get, that's my goofy term, and the more you have to talk through it. So people like me, who unfortunately spent a long time showing people something I don't think is very good, really forward along the hub, that's the midpoint of the grip, along the hub, forced toward the ground or the target, but definitely not back at me soon enough, normal, Soon enough, my golf swing, I have to alpha torque it late. That's the difference. We're saying that when three guys, Rick Dandy, Michael Jacobs, and Brian Manzella, with not two dissimilar bodies, none of us are built like, you know, Justin Thomas. All of us have golfing machine backgrounds. All of us tried to lag the crud out of it. All of us have handle dragging issues to this day. When we make our golf swings and you watch it naked eye, they look different. When you look at our golf swings on video, they look different. When you do any kinematic analysis of our swing, you know, like regular 3D kinematics, positional stuff, they look different. And guess what? Our forces and torques look different, but mostly our torques look a lot different. They do. 
when you do what the other side is doing, it looks the same. And this is the last thing I want to say before I start asking Mike some really good questions and everybody learns a lot about what we, what we, what we believe in the Gulf Swing. Everybody has the right to their opinion. Everybody who's teaching golf can teach whatever the heck they want to. Anybody, you can go follow whoever you want to. But if you think for one second that th th this conflict has been us, we've defended Dr. Steve's work. Th there's an active project going on to finish the software, the body part of the software, which is going to be revolutionary. We're under no directive by any outside force to give away anything. Uh, there's always this, this sort of a mythical uh, meeting that everybody wants to have. I'm pretty sure that um, the guys who run uh, the three big launch monitor companies would all love to pick each other's brains. I don't know if that would actually be good for the companies or good for golf. It ain't, ain't going to happen in our case. And I'm going to, one little last point. There was a little comment about chalk throwing. Like, if somebody threw me chalk, I couldn't do equations on the board. Well, that same person, that same PhD that that person was talking about was once questioned by me. And all I was going to say is, I've got about 100 golfers that I'm currently working with that about halfway down in the downswing, when that left arm's parallel, they look pretty damn similar. Are you going to try to tell me that there's nothing that they can do after that, which is what he was trying to tell me? He made me sit down. So I get one chalk throw for free because I was told to sit down when I was asking the question that was as simple as pie. You know why? Because it was going to make too much sense and it was going to make what the person was saying at least come into a little more question. That's it. So it is my distinct pleasure, show number five here with me and Ricky, to have uh, the namesake of Jacobs 3D, my teaching partner, my, um, you know, one of my best friends in the whole world. This, this three-man three group right here have been doing full Manzella shows four times a day for a long time. <laughs> they just haven't been on the air. And uh, it's a shame because some of them will probably have been some of the funniest things you ever heard. So uh, this is Michael Jacobs for the people that have never seen him but have heard about him. And uh, Michael is at the Rock Hill Golf and Country Club in Manorville, uh, New York, which is on Long Island. And uh, uh, welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for having me, Brian. You can hear me okay? Oh, man, you're loud and clear. So, um, first question, um, okay. how are things going with uh, the, the software development? So basically, as everybody, just so everybody knows, you got, you got the club, you got the body. So how, how are things going with the development, Mike? Uh, it's great. Um, we have worked really hard on this for a really long time. And the club analysis has been complete for a long time. And some of the things I want to talk about are some of the things I covered in the first book and what we're going to cover in the next book. And I think what people have to understand is, and this is something that I've driven home a bunch, is we're working with some pretty distinguished people who have to publish things. And um, I had gotten a message one day from another scientist or PhD uh, putting out a request for Dr. Nesbitt to debate him on Facebook. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Our people aren't going on social media to espouse their opinions. Okay, So what our scientific team is, is they develop the equations of motion. They listen to what we hear and say. And when you look at golf science, and golf science is in a bad place. Unfortunately, bad. absolutely. You have the greatest player in the world who's going at it alone now. Now, if people start here and that kind of stuff, they're going to think they don't need golf lessons. So golf science needs to really understand something important here, that 
if you're a golf teacher or you're a player, more importantly a player, right? Golf teachers, whatever. And you're doing something that is consistently working and working for you. Let's say you have a method as a teacher and nine out of 10 people who come, you're having success or maybe 10 out of 10. A golf scientist should solve why that works and show you why it works. That's what science is for. There has become this culture, which I personally didn't like. That's why I formed my own company and hired who I did. There's been this culture that if you teach something, you first have to check with golf's two or three PhDs who participate in social media. And that, to me, doesn't solve any problem. So let's get back to the software program. So the club is complete, and we have the most complete full body analysis ever created. And it will not, will not agree <laughs> with things that you've already seen. And that's great. And we have our team that does it, and papers will be published. And let's go to the closed loop for a second. Yeah, everybody, there's, there's something that everybody has said that, that uh, it, it can't be done, right? But if you do a little I'm Google search, it, it, it's exactly. been done a, a few times. Right. So people hear that, they don't know what it means. We talk scientific stuff, you know, because we have a team and all that. So basically what that's saying is, if I have a club in my hand and I push with my left arm, let's say, and I push with my right arm, there's an overall movement of the club, but because one arm could push into each other, or whatever, it's hard to figure out the contribution of each arm, right? So it was deemed a closed loop, and in a lot of published works, even Dr. Steve's original published works, it was just a 50-50 distribution, okay, of each arm. Well, in Alpha Man, Dr. Nesbitt solved the closed loop, and it's a major achievement, okay? And Alpha Man will show you the contributions from the different arms and sides of the bodies and wrists and all that. That is not going to be accepted by the other golf science team, and we're not going to do this whole thing with the club in that regard either. So let's just make that clear. So the, the body is coming along well. You will see ground reaction force without a force plate. Okay, The golfer moves throughout the body. Energy gets transferred throughout the body. They put a force into the ground, let's say, to keep it simple. And then there's a reaction to that. Okay, so you will see that, and that's going to be super interesting. So that's another that's another historical achievement. Wow. Well, yeah, I mean that, that was done at the USGA. So let's go back to our current situation of talking about torque on the club. So Brian, can you pull up? This is where it stems from. Can you pull up our Jacobs 3D angular acceleration graph? Okay, let's see angular acceleration graph. Okay, it's up. You can't see Ricky, but Ricky, he's there. Okay. So you're looking at a golfer, and you're looking, let me explain to you what this is. This is the angular acceleration in the alpha swing plane. Okay? So, so what I mean you, by just, that. Just to, just to be clear, right? Tell them exactly what that is. Alpha, yeah, the what alpha doing. plane. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah, okay. So if I took a stick, right, and I put it out, we're applying torque at the grip point, right? So I'll put this right at the middle of the grip, stick it out if I'm rotating around that, so around the clock. And in our system, this stays fixed and moves with the club, so however it's rotating around in the plane of the swing, right? This is not the beta, which is the change in pitch, or the gamma, the rotation around it. So this is the alpha, okay? Now, If you look at a swing angular acceleration graph, Brian put in uh, on the board there, the big black thick line is zero. The skinny black line running straight up and down, Brian, can you put your cursor on that or point anything at it? Yeah, the pointer is right on it, pointing to that line. I can't see the pointer. But yeah, but it's, it's, it's pointing to zero and the and the uh, beginning of the downswing. Okay. All right. You'll notice that, so we're going to go above the big black thick line is positive acceleration, right, the positive, and below is negative, right? So 
you'll notice that in transition, there's a positive angular acceleration. So what that means is even though the golfer, right, is finishing their backswing and you're seeing the club finish its backswing, right, there's a reversal angular acceleration, just to keep it simple, right? And then you'll notice that as the downswing progresses up until time zero impact, right, and this particular player kind of leveled off, he did a interesting couple things in his swing where it really laid down and things like that. And now you could see a ramp up in that graph and then a real sharp drop to negative. And, the, um, and, the, and, and that far right side of the graph is impact, right? Is impact time zero. Ladies and gentlemen, I have captured 1,197 swings as of the other day. It tallies them and keeps all the statistics. Driver, iron, everybody's slope is very similar to that. Okay? So alpha acceleration is pretty much inherently that shape. Give, 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 us, a sure. quick, give us a quick definition of acceleration. Okay, so that would be, um, you take a position of something, right? You have a position here, and if it, so I have a position here, and then as it moves, let's say it's rotating around, right? Right. Rotating around. It changes angle, right? Correct. So it's changing angle. You're doing that over time. You can figure out the velocity and the acceleration, okay? And torque and force are tied together with accelerations. So Brian, can you put up the uh, page from my book, page 19, the first book? And I'm gonna explain to you what we did in the first book, what we're doing different in the second book. Okay, so can you put them both side by side or is that not possible? Uh, yeah. That's right, we'll just leave this for now. It can be done. Okay. That's okay, you can leave it like that. Okay. You've, you've done some great job with these graphics. So if you look at the torque one, Torque equals, this is the most basic torque equation if you Googled it, the inertia of the club, which we're going to talk about, times the ex angular acceleration. Okay? You can get rid of that picture now. So that, that graph we looked at a second ago is the angular acceleration. Yeah. So, so now I got it on a chalkboard. Okay? So what that, can you put that graph back up? The graph is now back up. Ricky is okay. behind it. <laughs> All right. So you are you are seeing this in that graph, the angular acceleration of the club. And I'm going to suggest to you that every golfer has a similar slope. There'll be differences in acceleration a little bit here or there, but you're a human being swinging a club, right? Well, it's, let's say 40 inches. The length of the back swing is different for people, but you know. A human is a certain size and, and swings are done in a certain time that the angular acceleration graph ends up being very simple. Now, what golf science has done to date is they've done this. Essentially, this is obviously it's more in depth. You have to do a rotational matrix and all like that. They have the angular acceleration they calculate the moment of inertia of the club and they keep it constant. So then if I'm going to explain to you why they keep they, it constant. They, they, how they, that compute, they compute that before the swing, Michael? Yes. The moment yes. of inertia of the club. Okay. Do I have the in the screen here? Uh, just up to halfway into inertia. I'm going one way and this seems to be going the other way. Sorry, it's my first time on the show. Yeah, there you go, perfect. Okay, so if you measure this beforehand, which you have to anyway, right? But yeah. you keep this a constant. If this is a constant and this changes, which what you're seeing, the angular accelerating changes, which you're seeing in that graph, you attribute it all to torque. Okay? Makes sense. So this is constant. This is changing. But very, so simil very similar from golfer to golfer. Extreme, everybody has the same. That's why the other side says the analysis is you're stuck with it. 
And every guy, that this is also why they say the swing is over at left arm parallel. So what they're saying is because they're just looking at this graph. Let me ask right? you. Let me ask you a quick question. Yeah. The peak in that graph when that when that, that little thing goes up right around mind. right around right around that club like this. So left arm, well, around left arm parallels that peak. When that club's vertical, because that's you know. Yeah. So that's pretty much when I was told to sit down. I was trying to say. I was when you were told to sit down, <laughs> okay. probably because looking at an angular acceleration graph, you can't do anything else. So if you look at that graph, you're then a slave to just holding on or coasting or doing things like that. And it's un it's an unavoidable downtick. And it goes negative on every golfer. So golf science has championed, other than Dr. Nesbitt, and this goes beyond the little social media circles in the golf industry, has championed that you can't do anything after left arm parallel on the downswing because of what you see in that graph right there. My point, my, point, my, my point was, and this is you know, what, what I want you to ex expand on, my point was I've got a lot of golfers look exactly the same at left arm parallel. Uh, not exactly, but man, they could pose for the picture for the other guy <laughs> and girl. And from that point to the ball, wildly different things. When I, right. played, my, okay. when I played my worst golf, from basically around 98 to about 2008, 2010, in that area. Say 98 to 2010, 12 years of bad golf. I guarantee you, I go pull up any video from then. Michael knew me then. Probably have something from one of the first golf schools we did. And you stop me at that point in the swing, I look about the same. I'm about four shots around better now because what I do after that point is very different. Go ahead, Mike, just so you know. This so the Jacobs 3D class is six hours each day. When Manzel is coming to one, I think he's coming to Baltimore, we're going to make it eight each day. <laughs> what you just that's, saw. That's pretty, much it. that's pretty much it. Okay. So left arm parallel, this drops drastically. So really, no matter what you do in this analysis, everything. Whether you hit an iron shot and have to plow through a divot, it's the same. So if I was the other side, I'd be frustrated too with that analysis because it doesn't, I'm sitting there watching swings and everybody looks completely different. Everybody's doing different twisting actions on the club, it looks like, and this and that. And this gives you no explanation. This wasn't good enough for me no, in our analysis. No. We would have never, but, never did it. But Dr. Steve had this figured out 30 years ago. And explained it to us from day one. So. Can I ask you a quick question about that, what you just said? Quick question? Yeah. Uh, when you do a paper, I'm not, you know, I'm not a scientist. I, I do I do uh, magazine articles so far and, uh, and shows and videos, and I give lessons. That's what I do. One day I'm going to start writing some books like you, be a big boy like you. But, so I know about, I know about my profession. When scientists do a paper, publish a paper, like Dr. Steve's published several on the subject of force and torques, and the other side hasn't published. The main couple of people have not published any papers on it. Uh, none. They, they feel like there's no reason, in their defense, they think there's no reason to publish because they would just publish that graph. Right, okay, but the, the question right. is, is, is anybody who does one of these papers compelled to put every single answer to the question of how they did it in that paper so that the only if only if they want the readers to be able to recreate the study. You ever hear it like medicine and stuff where they say, oh, we weren't able to recreate the study? Yep. Like I'm sure I've had conversations with Dr. Nez, I'm sure he's going to publish something on the closed loop, but he's not going to compromise my, you know, my company. <laughs> that yep. works. Okay. Just wanted to. So now you're dealing with. This angular acceleration, since we're on the subject, subject of alpha, and it's the same just about on every player, right? Within or the same slopes. Yet this is a game, and, and I don't want to 
go too much into this because I'm publishing a book and this is the main piece. And there's going to be a stack of those acceleration graphs next to the swings and you're going to see these wildly different moves. Golfers explaining wildly different experiences swinging the club, right? If you went and I'm a history collector and I have books, I, I go grab Henry Cotton's book, I go grab Ben Hogan's book, I go grab this book, Bobby Jones. They're explaining completely different ideas and what they experienced in a golf swing. Yet this tells us everybody's the same. Now some people might like that, but we don't. Now, how do you decompose that graph and figure out the true experience of the golfer and what they actually did? Right? And this is where Dr. Steve is just, is just some things you know and there's some things you're good at. And this is one of the things he's good at. at. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's go back to this guy for a second. Back to the chalkboard. I use chalkboards a lot, and you had a nice little holder for the chalk. And right here, let's start with this one, right? Inertia. Just a real basic discussion on it. We know this. We see the angular acceleration. So this is all in the alpha direction is what we're talking about. Let's talk about inertia. Well, in the conversations we've had with our science team, we have uh, an inertia pendulum. Okay. You can take a club, and this is what you would do most of the golf world would do. Right where you're holding that grip, right between your hands, you would take the club, right, and you would suspend it in the pendulum, and it would swing, and you would figure out, you could do it with math, obviously, the moment of inertia of that body, based on that point that you're suspending it in. So if you chose the center of mass, let's say, and you twisted it around the center of mass, that would be the least resistance, the least amount of moment of inertia. You twisted it around that point. So what that means is if you twist it around the center of mass, if this was the point of interest, yeah. So Brian, keep doing that because I don't have a real club in here. Real golf so, club with, with this alpha beta gamma yeah. ball on the balance right. point, which means the center of mass is right by my finger. And so here twist it around, twist it around that, okay? Here we go, yay. I'll keep doing it. Uh, so the inertia about that point is the least amount of that body. Not that hard to so do. Whatever, so whatever torque Brian is applying now is creating an angular acceleration. Now, Brian, make that same twisting action, but grab it at the grip point. And do the same action. Well, it's a lot harder, man. I'm not, you know, it's a lot harder. A lot harder. Okay? Now go up the shaft as you're doing it. Start back at the center of mass. Twist it. Now go a little bit up on the shaft. Same twisting. Keep the same twisting. Starting to feel more resistance? Just a little bit, yeah. Go up a little. All right. A little more. Don't torque it any extra. No. It just feels different. Now go all the way up at the top of the grip point. Okay, so look at the response that Brian's getting. Look how he's starting to use his body a little and more. And I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm starting to move the point too. I, I couldn't keep the point. Yeah. Okay. Now you start, that force is starting to come in, and that's where we'll talk about this part. So Brian tried to, right, do the same torque that whole time, right? He tried to do the same torque the whole time, but as he moved up and down the club, this changed, which changed this. So this, Brian, in his little basic experiment, let's not play gotcha or anything, right? Tried to apply the same amount of torque. This changed, so therefore that changed as he did it. Okay. Now, when you swing a golf club, your entire system, your body, your arms, your club, are trying to overcome that moment of inertia of the club. Okay. And if we, let me grab a real golf club. Let me grab a real club. The full, man, man's club, the right? full Manzella. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm trying to get in your view here. I'm, uh, you got to go the other way. Got to go the other way. Sorry, I'm a rookie at the full Manzella. There you go. Although I experienced the full Manzella the whole time. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, there you so, go. We can see you. When you're swinging a club, you're overcoming the mass of the club, right? The basic mass of the club when you linearly move it, so to speak. And you're overcoming that moment of inertia when you swing it around. When you move it, based on skill level and just based on your own inherent ability to learn how to play golf and do it, is you start to move it in a way that you try to find the least amount of resistance. So that's why lag is such a big thing with great players, because when they move the club early on in the downswing, when you lag it a lot, the club, if you do it right, will rotate right around its own mass center at that point. Okay, is everybody following me so far? So it's rotating right around its own mass center at that point. So the golfers, even though they're holding it and imposing their will here, they're feeling the least amount of resistance because it was the same as Brian twisting like this. So if you do your analysis and just assume that the moment of inertia of the club is from here to there, just the grip point, just that static body, you're not describing that actual experience at each instant in time, right? You're talking about a moment of inertia of a certain length, yet at that point, the golfer is experiencing much less resistance, much less rotational resistance. And this was a no-brainer for Dr. Nesbitt. He did this 30 years ago. This is how, this is what you do when you design machines. The moment of inertia at every instant in time, instantaneous, to know what the machine is overcoming is the key. Or the machine would fail. Dr. Nesbitt is, is a master of robotics. The robot, the end effector of the robot, wouldn't achieve what it was trying to do if the resistance wasn't known at every instant in time. So basically, and when... when, 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 when I'll lose my train of thought. Okay, I'll ahead. lose my train of thought. I've got two questions. Go ahead. So we know the mass of the club. We're overcoming that for force. That's probably pretty easy to figure out. But the moment of inertia is interesting. And it's dependent on the point that you choose to analyze. You could very well choose to do the standard thing and do it about the grip point. But the club never, maybe once or twice in a swing, pivots around that point. And when it does pivot around that point, it's usually at left arm parallel. That's the only time it pivots, and then it moves out. And then other phenomena start to happen. So by not analyzing the instantaneous resistance, you don't left arm explain the experience of a golfer. Okay. So let's leave that part for now. What are your two questions on on that inertia part? So, so it's great that you. So, so let me see if I got this more or less right. High end golf swing, early on in the downswing, probably the club is rotating around the mass center, right? Uh, yeah, we maybe you, maybe you can draw that in the Jacobs 3D class. We talk about how to see that on video and stuff. But yes, okay, uh, and then maybe, maybe about maybe about halfway down, maybe right after or right around that 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 point that, that peaked on the angular acceleration graph. It's going to be close to the midpoint of my hands, right? It's going to kind of move down there, and then yeah, I, and we would call that eye static. Okay, and then and then down here by the ball, a real handle dragger it would move up in the middle of my arm somewhere, right? So, as the club moved out, but yeah, if, if they the club, kept, as the club moved but, but, that, but, but a lot of people but overdo be, this. But it could be between my arms somewhat. I'm just, I'm, I got a question I'm asking. Well, that's what you want it. Okay, okay. You want it to suck energy okay. out of you. Okay, so but that spot. I've seen a lot. That spot is in space, right, sometimes. Not on the body, not on the club, right? That point that the club is rotating around. It could around. be. It could, it be. could be, but it's not. But I've heard the term, it's floating around. It yeah, is floating. Okay, so that's the question. <laughs> the question is, we are not figuring out torque, that you're torquing it at a spot that's floating around. That's, Nothing's floating. No, this club has got a tremendous no, load no, no, on no, no, I'm, I'm, it. I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm just saying, I'm just trying to give you, tee you up here. Down here by the ball, this point between my arms where the club is rotating around in my golf swing, I've seen it, 
between my arms, a little bit too close to my left arm down here. I, we're not figuring torque out on, at this spot. No. I'm not applying right. at the spot. This is Let's a this is an court. urban this is an urban oh, legend right. that needs to go away today. Urban legend. Watch. You're applying I got it the at the court. Watch. I'm, I'm Watch. watching. Go ahead. Every golfer in the world, Ben Hogan wanted to have three right hands, right? Yep. So. What you just described in your swing, what yep. you just did in that little swing, is you were putting in torque the whole time, right? Yeah. So you were putting in torque, trying to, right, the experience of the golfer. Exactly. But as this changed, that changed that. Now, there's a conversation of what causes this. Forces at a distance from the mass center in different directions, actual twisting actions of the golfer. That's a separate story. That I'm laying out in the book. But the point to drive home is this is not a constant when you're swinging a golf club. If it were, you would swing like this. Watch. You would keep it at the grip point the whole time. People don't swing like this. People swing like that and change. When you're lagging, you're lagging to keep the rotational resistance down. And you have direct control of that by movement paths of the hub. Okay? Which is a the hub, mid midpoint in the hands is the hub. Yeah, the hub is, is always deemed to be some secondary effect that everybody talks about. But you know what? If I'm applying force at the grip point, let's say, and I go like this and I shape my hub this way, I'm creating angular motion there, but I'm not trying to torque it at my wrist. And we break down all six inputs of the golf. So let me continue on this. Okay. So back to here. I don't know how to get in the camera. Right I'm sorry. Perfect. Perfect right there. This right here. This is the most basic form of an equation, right? There are six possible inputs that could be involved here. Six. In my first book, I covered three elements of the swing. Huh? Elements yeah. of the swing. I truly like an E, I'm sorry. Right? In the first book, I covered three alpha, beta, gamma torques. Right. And we covered one more by showing just the overall force that the golfer applies. Correct. Okay? So we broke down the rotation of the club and the actual torquing action that the golfer puts on the grip. And that's what you see in those graphs. With an instantaneous moment of inertia. Right? Right. And we talked about the overall force, but the directions of the force are important. And in the new book, we take this and we break it down into all three. So now you'll have six inputs that sum the moments of what you're seeing in the, in the alpha direction or in the angular direction. Okay? But for the sake of the conversation right now is... There's a lot of variables. How you swing the club and why swings look differently doing it is manipulating that. You're more likely to do a better job manipulating this than you are that. That's why we always say it's not, it's not just about the bottom of the swing. Correct. But right here, this part, manipulating that, that's where your movement paths come in and so many things you could do to manipulate what your system is overcoming. And that's what, how we've been able to, Brian, can you talk to your screen pops up on mine for a sec? I only see Rick Dandy right now. Um, do you just say something? No, <laughs> unless you're on right. Facebook, but I'm, but I'm here. We, we're yeah. all three on the yeah, screen. No, no, no. I just needed you to do that so I could see you. Yeah. Okay? Rick, when you talk, I only see you and Brian disappear. So when you look at that angular acceleration graph, right, you're not stuck with that. That analysis gets you nowhere. What we're providing is the six inputs that cause that. We're going through exactly how to manipulate those and then tracing it through the body on how it's passed on. So that's the most basic coverage of what's different about our analysis and what others you might heard about. Okay, I've been looking at that angular acceleration graph for 10 years now because <laughs> I started with Dr. Manfred. Every time I run a golf swing, I look at it. The Manzella handle drag and the Manzella flick swing, the flick swing, 
the one that started this whole thing. Your angular acceleration graph looked like that, right? And I'm putting it in my book. But your experience was you flicked it. So just because that angular acceleration is dropping doesn't mean the golfer is applying a twist to the it club. Felt like and the, one of the it, it felt like the worst it felt like the club oh, no. weighed 16,000 pounds at impact compared to any other club. That's because the resistance was high. Now, conclusions are stemmed from science. The conclusion that you can't do anything after left arm parallel is a disaster. The conclusion that you put a little push with your wrists in and then hold on and coast is a disaster. And I'm going to suggest to you this notion that because of looking at that graph that your right hand is slowing it down and the golfer is trying to go like this to stop it. It's not a good analysis. So, but so there's here's we'll, the we'll, 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 we'll forget this. Just part of this I wanted to do today was so that people who had no idea what all of this is about have an idea. And then if they really wanted to learn a little bit deeper stuff like Mike's talking about, they could get that too. But... <laughs> Let me, let me stand up and show this. So, when you look at a Fred Couples going through the ball like this, it looks like that. And some of the time, especially when he's not hitting the ball off the ground, his right hand sort of like comes away from his left hand like this. As he's going, like that. We're saying that he's probably... It depends on how the force is, yeah. yeah he's probably ad he's adding as much as he can, and his right wrist can straighten faster than his left wrist. It just, kinematically, it can. And right. that's why the hands come off. They're saying that somehow Fred Couples and VJ Singh, who I saw in person in their primes, have them on video in their primes doing this thing, look like to me, because I was a handle dragon teacher right there, I thought those two guys were borderline flippers, <laughs> right? Because they didn't have that club up their left arm for a long time. Those guys were throwing the crud out of it. They're saying, the other side of this debate, they're saying that they have somehow magically figured out that if they can take their right hand off the club, that slows the club down more. Not that exactly. trying to speed it up makes it go faster. No, and, and, and that just happens to, in their case, their hands come apart. No, 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 no. They're saying they're learning. This is what's important about getting this right. If the conclusions don't make any sense, there's a guy, no names. You notice how we don't, have to say names because there's some professionalism over on this side here. There's a guy who did a video who said, I don't care what it looks like to you out there listening to me. I don't care what it feels like you're doing. I don't care what you looks like on video you're doing. The club is trying to check swing torque. Let me tell you. Because folks. of that crap. Let me tell you. It's because of that crap. Let me tell you, folks. The one thing, and they've misrepresented this. This, this is more about misrepresentation than about anything else. They've misrepresented this a million times. One of the things I said early on, and it's been grabbed on by the other side, just like political commentary, they have a talking point. Why is this better? Well, the reason it's better is when we analyze a swing, and this happens all the time, and then Mike starts looking at the graph, and he's telling somebody, first timer that just got captured what they just did sometimes without even having seen the swing because sometimes I'll do the capture in a school and Michael go in the room and run the swing which is you know 15 feet away and then he reports to this person well this and that and you know what it seems like your right elbow should hurt a lot and uh, I bet you you hit a lot of fat shots with short iron <laughs> because and they all say this is exactly what it feels like because why why michael why is it exactly when you report it somebody says that's what it feels like why the easiest way i could just, just sum it up for you is it's just dr nesbitt is just right but because that because the golfer is doing that that that's what kinetics mm -hmm. is it is what and the golfer did that's why it feels and like it's it what is. the golfer did. And, and, you know, the conversation always comes up is, we want to hear from Dr. Steve. We want to hear, you know, he wrote the equations of motion to explain exactly what's happening. It's on my laptop, right? I, you, it's on my, I cannot tell you anything about a golf swing. That's it. He did his job. The interpretation is now up to us. 
You can easily, and you can easily I, almost I, remember I, it. So go ahead. If he wants to explain what he does and, and do things like that, he does it in published papers. And that's that's how academia should work. So, But it should be known, if, if, if you're going to be there right now, it should be known that, uh, you know, sort of a team decision and, uh, along with, you know, the your ghost writer, that's not so much of a ghost, Matt Rudy, uh, that it would be a good idea this in this new book that Dr. Steve did two things. One, a little mechanical explanation of what we were talking about today, Tori. We already did that, yes. We, right. we have, we have and, the six and, inputs. And, and, and a, in an interview that, that Rudy, uh, Matt Rudy is going to do with him in, the, in one of the last chapters, a question, like, how can a golfer, there seems to be a lot of questions out there, how can a golfer have late alpha, like Manzella? How can a golfer have late alpha? Well, he's, he's going to explain it. And, and, and for about 10 minutes, it seemed like that was good enough. Everybody would wait the book. Mike works on the book every day. I'm calling him. He's we're doing Photoshop things back and forth. How do you do this? How do you do that? So it, the book's coming out, folks. I mean, Mike wants to get this thing over with, right? The, so the, this is going to wrap up the experience of the golf club. So th there's going to be an answer besides what Mike would tell you today. And besides what might be perfectly capable of just spitting out the code. And Mike would even say in a 12-hour Jacob's 3D class that he just did one of them. And um, how many people have gone through the class so far, Mike? How about 30-something yeah, in so the first four or five classes? If, you, if you're interested in this stuff, let me just tell you, how much do you charge for the class, two-day class? It's six ninety nine because most of the time I'm traveling and things. Right? Yeah, so for 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 for... for Less than a lot of these seminars that are going to go on down there in Florida, and we're having one, by the way, on Wednesday night. It's forty-five dollars for two hours. Um, you, you can look at all of these swings, you know, blown up on you know big screens, and 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 get the, the minutia if you want the minutia. But the fact of the matter is, is that trying to make this out to be some sort of a um, a marketing gimmick is the biggest joke and the biggest lie ever told. It's just a lie. So it's, it's, well, now let's get to the next part, Brian. Can you put up next to the acceleration graph the four torque graphs from the Nesbitt paper that everyone always discusses? Oh, the three positives. The paper. Yes. Okay. So, can you pull that up? There you yeah, I'm going to make it real big and uh, so everybody can okay. see it. And put it, I'll put so it. So if you look at, behind you, <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes, uh, can you move that? Yeah, one put it back on top of everybody. And before you get accused of covering up uh, the negative one? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So we'll put the, everybody saw the alpha acceleration so, graph enough. So, so this is, this is the, this is the, this is the alpha torque graph. Alpha from component. Paper that's often discussed. And which paper is that? Because people can go on Jacob's 3D. Work and power. So this Work is the one power. that's thrown in our face often. Okay. Okay. So here's the torque, right? The golfer is applied alpha torque. Now, you want to hear the perfect storm of events? Sure. When one day, when, when we, you look back on this and you describe what happened, the one male scratch golfer applied his torque to the club almost identical to the angular acceleration graph. The, <laughs> so how, would and, you do, how would somebody actually wind up doing that? Uh, well, he's super strong. Well, okay, so if you, you know, we should have had this picture. It's, I put it on uh, postmodern golf. I put the picture, I superimposed his club over one that would be like positive. So the, this golfer's club was like this at impact. So hitting, hitting a drive, right? Ball, you know, struck the shot the way that the club was being forced, he was able to actually put a little negative twist on it at that point. But you're talking about very little. But it kind of matches the angular acceleration graph. Yeah, it looks a little bit like And it. then Dr. Nesbitt described that golf swing. And the one thing is the description part, when Dr. Steve tries to, tried to make a um, 
explanation of what he saw. That was the hardest part for him because he's only doing the mechanical part. He didn't have me to do it at that time. And I think he would have wrote that differently now. And he even admits that. He, he has no problem doing that one day. Okay. So there's your male scratch player. Which when one? You, the the, the, the one that the one negative, right? right? That, that's the, the bold yeah, the line. Yeah, the Basing turbo heads, he matches up pretty well with the acceleration graph, which is really funny. Yes. Think about it. And then there was the discussion that because of that angular acceleration graph always being negative, there is no way to positively put torque on the club, twist on the club. Yet in the paper, which everybody now agrees with, everybody says they agree with Nesbitt, three of the four subjects are positive. Yep. And that club all for that sound for the you know boom. and one is just about peaking yeah just and like it's it's very, just like my stock swing right the peak is right before impact and just about how everybody is when they swing an iron these days i mean this was a driver in a long time ago the one negative the guy's a moose it says in the paper that his wrist did negative work they were doing positive work they just were doing a little bit less because of the position that he was when he, when he had it. so the continual thing saying you agree with Nesbitt and putting that description up and putting that one graph up kind of is the perfect storm. Um, he's just, he says to me all the time, I said, Dr. Steve, they always talk about this one swing. Should we, in your next one, let's let's describe another. He's just one subject, he always says. It's just one swing. I, he says, I watch golf every once in a while and everybody looks differently do it. Why would you? marry yourself to that one explanation. So what we're providing is not only for the first time ever published books describing this stuff, but what you're witnessing here is the golf industry solving problems with the best researcher ever in the history of the game. And now that we're into the body and we're talking about torques, joint torques, the solving closed loop, weighing us down with all this ridiculous stuff is actually taking away from golf and making people not want to look at golf science. And Brian has said it a million times, go do your classes, go do your things. I went to them. I didn't learn anything or use anything from it because whatever. And we do ours with Dr. Nesbitt. And there's a little explanation of why ours is different. And, uh, and, and the, idea, the, the idea that, that we made fun of anybody. Listen, uh, uh, the Tonight Show has been on the air for over 50 years. They make fun of every president. I, I don't think we've made fun of anybody. All we've ever said is, and from the beginning, from the beginning, I said, hey, man, just sell what y'all are selling on one side of the street. We'll sell what we're selling on the other side of the street. Everybody can remain cordial, and uh, history books will figure out. If you go back to the, you know, I, we're both, as, you, as it says here on the screen, top 50 Golf Digest and top 100 Golf Magazine. This is something that, you know, there's very few accolades you could get in the industry, and for two little guys that are at basically public facilities their whole lives, that didn't have a golf silver spoon in their mouth, uh, didn't have, you know, tour players running around saying they're the greatest thing in the history of the world. Uh, we did pre we've done pretty good so far. But the, the one thing that I think people need to understand about, about uh, all of this stuff, this, this whole, you know, you sell and I sell and I think, just go back to these early lists. Go back to the top 100 lists 10, 15 years ago. Back, go back to the original top 50 list, whatever year that Golf Digest started doing that. And look at those guys. They are guys who were in the top 10 who aren't in the top 50 anymore. And they are guys who were in the top 10 that are still in the top 10. So what does that tell you? Because some of them are still just as active or just dropped all the way down to the very bottom of the list. What does that tell you? Some have become less relevant and some have become the same amount of relevant and either there's three possibilities, either what you were doing kept was working, kept working, 
or you kept reinventing yourself and learning and you're sort of like on the list like for the second time even though you're up up in the top 10 and then or you just your stuff just didn't work and people figured it out and it worked a little bit and now it's down the road that's all we wanted for this but this is not it's not good enough for certain people it's not good enough that they want they want they want us to give them what we not going to give them ever not that ever and um we've asked 99 times for everybody to just chill and let's try to be professional about this but it keeps falling on deaf ears um, some of the stuff i've read the last couple of days and seen the last couple of days just just amaze me um if you think that my golf swing has never changed you don't you've never watched me over the years play if you think that when rick dandy is trying to hit a high sweepy cut or a low push hook with the same club that his inputs to the club are going to be the same rick can over lag it with the best of them what in the world good is any kind of equation that comes out with everybody doing something the same when everybody will tell you i tried to do two different things on those swings i've done that so many times at rock hill in the lab at, at, at mike's golf school where i've done what we you know we used to call them ridiculous trials swings all kinds of crazy different swings try swings where i tried to get the center of rotation to thirty thousand feet <laughs> swings where i tried to torque it right away and wound up forcing it to get the club to do something crazy right away to, to torque it late the flick swing all these things. every time i do these wildly different swings all of the jacobs 3d graph depict that one of the offers we made to try to bring some of this to a close. There's a big golf uh, seminar idea I had. I didn't really want to do it. I thought it was a good idea. I gave it to some guys. They've made some money doing it. God bless them. We said, hey, we'll show up at this thing. Uh, you guys capture a swing, bring in some golfer, capture a swing. We'll go in a hermetically sealed room, capture a swing, give them a lesson, tell everybody what the all the graphs are saying that golfer did. Everybody can look at the video, some, you know, club delivery numbers, you know, from a, a good device. Uh, uh, and then you give them a lesson based on what you think you saw. And then they go in a room and then me and Mike or just Mike come out and capture a swing and run it through Jacob's 3D and do that. That was flatly rejected. That's not going to prove anything. I think it would prove a lot. I think, I think the other side's scared to do it. Because what 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 if um, what if they lay an egg? I mean, the, the, all of those people are all saying that everything we do is egg laying. So we got nothing to lose there. I mean, we. One of the things that's sort of interesting is is that Michael has given you know a thousand golf lessons more than that. But I mean, a thousand different golfers, some of whom come to him a lot. I mean, like you know, like Chen uh, with the software. One of the things that, that, that attracted me to TrackMan uh, and, and w was sort of like the whole genesis of, of, of being golf science was I used to go to these simulator booths at the, at the merchandise show and I could hit some funny looking shot trick and I would get up there and I would try to take a five iron or six iron and hit a rope hook and I could rope hook a ball like 80 yards in the air and the ball would just go to the right and just stay over there in the simulator and I would hand the club to the people and the first time I ever did it in a booth and the ball hooked like it was supposed to was the track man booth when you're teaching tour players on track man if it was a terrible machine they would they wouldn't use it they would just say no and no, i didn't do that on that swing that's what makes a product or an equation useful it produces results in the real world field some of these people that are talking about this do not well all of them do not have almost all of them there probably do not have a working studio where they can capture swings and give a bunch of lessons a couple of dozen would be nice before they open them up they don't or pay michael and get captured and take a lesson spend the day and learn some stuff um, we have done our best for three years to keep the level of discourse 
to some professional. What an easy. Everybody knows O'Brien. He'll argue the world is flat against Galileo just for fun. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I consider myself pretty good at it. And it's fun, right? If it's all in fun. But we didn't do things even like this for three years for a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons, business reasons, software development going on, people bothering Dr. Steve. You know, I mean, it, 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 it was, it, it's been hilarity for three years. So, but the time has come today. The time has come. This stuff needs to stop. And what, let me tell you what the other side is going to say. No, they're dumb. They're stupid. They don't know what they're doing. They're not capable. Listen, everybody's capable. I've never met a good golf teacher who wasn't capable of learning way more about how the golf swing works than I know now. Don't tell me or this guy from Long Island on this side of me or this guy from Bethesda on this side of me. Don't tell me that those guys with the best teacher in the world on the subject of how to move a rigid body and how to how to how it how it moves and how how you describe the movement. Um, don't tell me that we can't learn from the smartest guy ever on the subject. We've learned a lot, and Michael's learned way more than me. Why? Because he spent more time with Steve. Period. He's spent more time studying. Period. And he has a working system that he uses every day in his teaching with all levels of golfers, tour players all the way down to you know really regular players and he talks about it all the time i talk about it a lot too but not at that level that's why i don't think michael's smarter than me i don't think michael thinks he's smarter than me he knows a lot more about this than me so there's a perfect example of not being capable i'm not in his le i'm not in his league talking about this stuff i'm just as capable he could start teaching me everything he knows right now and at some point i would catch him Probably in him teaching me, he would learn some, and I would still have to catch him some more. He could start Rick tomorrow in the studio and catch him up probably in about a year. It's taken Mike, you know, six or seven years with Dr. Steve. So um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for a certain level of discourse. The merchandise show is coming up. It should be something that everybody's looking forward to. It shouldn't be one of those things where you're turning a corner, looking to see if somebody's on a row and you're going to get on a different row. Uh, it's, it's the, as the uh, Reed Exhibition people with the PGA logo behind them say, it's the major, it's the major of the business of golf. And one of the parts of the business of golf is the golf instruction business, which is what this show is all about. So um, I'm going to let, I'm going to let the boys, um, wrap up rick what g give us give us a wrap up of what you think about all of this and then we'll let michael close well well it's important to really think about where we really are uh in in golf history so right now um we're 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 kind of like mitigating the idea that you're going to go out and you decide to take your clubs and conquer the world and get bad advice and kind of kind of like learn maybe you're not hitting the ball well one month one week one year and you keep getting bad advice so um, we've all done that we've gone into brick walls uh, people have handled dragged uh, till their bank account was empty so uh, there, there was a, there, there's a reason why you know former world's number ones didn't talk to the gurus okay there's there's reasons for that so um, looking forward you know, we're not afraid of new ideas. That's what postmodern's all about. Um, and, and I want to interject there about ideas. Right. Every single concern, I'm going to make a nice word there, concern, that has ever been brought up about Jacob's 3D and Stephen Nesbitt's work has been brought to Steve and discussed, and everything is discussed yeah. at the level is... Somebody might have something, and yeah. and and uh, if anybody's got any ideas, uh, we, we look you, at everything. You know, uh, uh, anybody that's uh, anybody that has any questions, you, you got two feet. I know a good travel agent. Uh, I'll be happy to arrange a flight for you to Rock Hill, and we can all go there and hang out for a few days, and you can learn some new things. That's fine. 
but it's a free country. You can do what you want. Uh, we're on a different trajectory. We're on a different trajectory. Mike? And we welcome up, any, anybody that wants to come in and uh, learn. What do you think, Mr. Jacobs? Oh, well, that was fun to discuss these things, you know. That was probably the most in-depth we ever got. I uh, want everybody to realize that the call for inputs to the club, there's six of them, right? And we're going to go into that and discuss this more. It's more complex than just that torque equation. That's a good starting point. It's all closed loop, full body analysis, all from Dr. Stephen Nesbitt with myself and one other, two other people actually helped us. And um, Dr. Nesbitt will publish his scientific stuff when he chooses to. I publish the golf stuff when I choose to. And uh, the greatest researcher in the history of the game doesn't need to call up a couple of golf scientists and go to the and check his work as possible. Well, folks, we, uh, we were uh, glad that we had the opportunity today to uh, do a pop-up show. A little jack of random music playing in the background. We will see you folks soon. Thanks so much. Keep them straight.